We believe very different things about the state and what the state should have the power to do. Um, and everybody there understood that when that was over and we were gonna fight our corners tooth and nail, we were gonna go have a beer together. And I think people need to see it in order to remember that that's the best America has to offer. And if we're not fighting for that principle, uh, you know, you only get to keep the things that you fight for. The best part about that civic debate was um, Sarah's son coming up to me afterwards and admitting that he felt I was right. Um, <laughs> that was, <laughs> in all seriousness, it, uh, I mean, Sarah's not joking. When Sarah and I debate, and our debates stem all the way back to the Wyoming legislature when Sarah served also. And I do agree it was one of the most important things that I had the opportunity to participate in this summer, just based on the, uh, the capability of showing people it's okay to disagree with each other. Americans are capable of achieving extraordinary things when they have the freedom and opportunity to do so. This is American Potential, and here's your host, Jeff Crank. Well, thanks for joining us for another episode of American Potential. You know, it seems that people are getting more into their own echo chambers in America, particularly regarding politics, and either by only following media that they agree with or only sharing their opinion with people that don't have a differing viewpoint. And social media has made this effect even worse, segmenting your friends into people who only agree with you. Now, because of this, people are missing out on learning how to have a civil debate. And as a country and as individuals, we can't grow if we can't talk to people with differing views. Engaging with differing viewpoints expands our understanding, and it allows people to gain insights um, into different ways of thinking. And it also makes individuals look at their viewpoint from a different angle. If we want free speech to survive in society, we have to remember how to talk with people with whom we disagree. We wanted to do an episode with two guests that would be considered on the opposite sides of the political spectrum and have a conversation on an issue. So I want to welcome Sarah Berlingame, who is the executive director for Wyoming Equality, and Tyler Lindholm who is Americans for Prosperity's state director in Wyoming. And I'd like to welcome them both to the show to talk about how they have conversations, and then we'll have them engage in a civil debate about an issue. Tyler and Sarah, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having us. Really appreciate it, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so you all have had... um, uh, a debate like this and probably many o- over the years, but how'd you all get to know each other? I'll let Sarah kick the ball on this. I think it's a, it's, it's kind of a fun, fun story. Yeah. So I first met Tyler when he was uh, in the legislature. I think the first thing I knew about him actually was he was the sponsor of Wyoming food freedom. And as someone who had started a um, farmer's market, I was a huge fan um, that really, uh, did a lot for us. Um, but yeah, I was the, I came in working for Wyoming Equality in 2015 and Tyler was the world's most unlikely, um, sponsor and advocate of non-discrimination, uh, for LGBTQ folks. And I, we probably waited like 30, 40 seconds before, uh, we started our first argument. Um, and we just been <laughs> off to the races since. Is that right, Tyler? No, I think that's, pretty fair that Sarah's wrong a lot. And so (laughs) I've kind of taken this burden on my shoulders um, to try and, you know, help Sarah out and help her find her way. (laughs) Straighten her out a little bit, Tyler. Is that what you're trying to do? I'm I'm just trying. (laughs) You know, I can tell one thing, and I'll tell you this is something that I, and and I have always tried to engage in civil debates. Uh, You know, I spent 14 years doing a radio show, and I would love, I loved having people who disagreed with my point of view on the show because I believe, and you're both exhibiting this, humor is a is an, a really important part of that, right? Self-deprecation, humor, um, and, and not taking yourself too seriously, I think, is a really important point. Tyler, would you agree with that? Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, and I think this is something that's lost on a lot of people um, when it comes to things that um, 
when it comes to civil debate and how you talk about issues, and especially issues uh, such as social issues or things that uh, strike at the root or, or pretty close to us at home, you, you have to be able to take, uh, take yourself and, and some of those um, deep-seated feelings out of the equation to be able to um, surpass and be able to overcome and be able to actually find common ground. And you might not find common ground whatsoever. Sarah and I certainly disagree on certain issues uh, vehemently, and uh, that's okay. Um, we'll still break bread and we'll still show each other grace uh, because ultimately at the end of the day, we're going to concentrate on the things that we do agree on. Uh, you know, raw milk, for example, uh, food freedom, those types of issues. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's such an important point. I've got so many questions to get to, but I want to lay the groundwork. Tell us a little bit about your politics. Let's start with you, Tyler. Uh, tell us if you had to describe yourself, describe your politics. I think, it, and Wyoming's very different than a lot of other states. I mean, Wyoming is a majority Republican state. But the reality is with most Republicans in the state of Wyoming is they have a fairly wide uh, streak of libertarianism, uh, especially so for myself. I'm an old school Ron Pollard. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I'd say I'm a, um, I'm a pretty big time lib- libertarian, small L libertarian um, with roots in the Republican Party in the state of Wyoming um, that goes back to before statehood. And Sarah, how about you? I, I'm a liberal Democrat. I'm a queer activist who um, has been engaged with, um, you know, the Democratic Party pretty much since I could vote. And in that time, I've also voted for independents and Republicans and um, no libertarians on on the candidate, but or on the ballot. But uh, if there was a good one, I, I'd vote for him. If Tyler was in my district, I'd, I'd vote for him. And then I'd <laughs> fight him every second. <laughs> um, I think the, 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 the most important thing to me about like how I view my own politics and um, being a Wyoming Democrat is just how committed we are to pluralism. And I see like the threat to that from extremes on, on both sides, but I really mean like the Freedom Party here in Wyoming is that there is no commitment to pluralism. And it's, you know, a, a value that they're rapidly eroding and if you don't have a really robust sense of like, I don't need you to agree with me to agree that the principles should uphold for everybody, then we're sunk, we're lost. So I'm, I'm, I'm just as forceful and passionate about that as any sort of platform that the Democratic Party has. Uh, Sarah, do you if if Tyler has his cowboy hat on, do you ever make fun of him because he looks like Woody from Toy Story a little bit? <laughs> That's a great question. That's probably the important question. You know what's really funny is Tyler's profile picture yeah. on like Twitter and everything is a picture that I took of him and he's wearing my scarf. And my sure. profile picture, where I'm talking about like, you know, not banning books and stuff, is a picture of me. And I stole his hat when we were at the legislature. Cause all I have to do, like we did this at a Halloween party once, is I put his hat on and people say, Who are you? And I'll say, Taxation is theft. And they'll go, oh my God, you're Tyler Lindholm. <laughs> it's like one hat, one phrase, they got it. That's a good brand. <laughs> that is. <laughs> what do you think of all that, Tyler? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm here for it. I, you know, I mean, um, Wyoming's fun and politics can and should be fun also. And that's part of, um, like, for instance, my Twitter picture where I've got this robust scarf on. I really honestly think Sarah only brought that up because I, I think I honestly look better in in that oh. scarf than she does so um, this is where we say we fight our corner right like <laughs> this is where it comes down like yeah it's not but yeah. i think that's the thing that I, people are surprised right like i'm a liberal democrat but i tell people all the time i find it so hard to find people like tyler who are not fragile in their sense of politics and that like tyler expects me to fight my corner mm-hmm. i expect tyler to fight his corner and neither one of us fall apart when we go hard on it. And I think that people have this false idea that, like, you just have to be real, real gentle with each other. And you have to, you know, not talk about the hard things. And I think we fight on the hard things, like who looks better in that scarf? And should Medicaid be expanded? Of course it should. And Tyler's almost there. He's almost there. <laughs> Are you almost there on Medicaid expansion, Tyler? You know, I, I, I think I could possibly get there if I didn't live in reality but that's the rub right i keep i keep looking around and i'm like oh that's 
it's a real wall and I can't, <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I, no, I'm, I don't think I'm going to quite get there. Uh, but I look forward to the debate this year when the uh, Wyoming legislature, I'm certain will be, revisit Wyoming, uh, Wyoming Medicaid expansion. Um, and I, uh, I expect there to be robust debate. And once again, for the 47th time in a row, I suspect I will win. <laughs> now, let, let me just say, you know, I, I ran for Congress when I, when I was a candidate, I loved, I was, I ran as a Republican and I loved going. I had the Democrat party ask me to come and speak to them. And I loved it. I relished it. I in, enjoy walking into a room knowing that there's a lot of people probably with the moment I walk in who dislike me because of my name, because of the R behind my name um, and going in and, and being able to show them that I'm, you know, I want to walking out of there going, you know, that guy's pretty good guy. Uh, to me, that's a challenge that I've always embraced um, because I, I think it's, it, it, it is the best traditions of America, right? Is to have, these debates, these discussions, these arguments, but still walk away and be able to be friends and, and talk. It's what's made our republic survive through all of these years. Sarah, any, any thoughts on that and the ability to, to, to embrace that difference and, and be able to go at people? Yeah, absolutely. This is me like waving the flag saying that's about to go away. Like it's about to go away. Uh, we could not be under more threat right now of losing that essential part of American democracy. I mean, you look at the chamber, the echo chambers on both sides, and you look at like how much pressure and threat there is to show up in somebody else's space, right? Like, I mean, I think Tyler, <laughs> ordinarily, it would mean nothing to him to like show up and do the you know, Wyoming Civics Day debate with me, you know, his friend Sarah. But the pressure chamber of um, purity and, you know, never, ever acknowledging the reality of pluralism, how we live together, um, or that you would show up next to a Democrat. I mean, I think there was a lot of pressure there. And Wyoming didn't used to be that way. But the Freedom Caucus and certain extremist elements are really pushing it. And same thing with me, right? Like, I'm going to get crucified for being on your show. And I do not care. <laughs> and I need more people to not care. I need more people to, like, resist that, um, that, that, that cancellation and that purity of, like, where we belong, where our voices should be. Okay, I'm going to just throw this out there because it's right in front of us. But uh, in the free speech debate, which side, uh, the left or the or the right, if you will, which side is is more intolerant today? I'll start with you, Tyler. I don't you know, here's here's the kind of wild part. I would have said in 2015 through 2018, I would have said the left. Um but as time has progressed, it's like both sides have decided to really suck on this issue and really just abandon the First <laughs> Amendment. Um, so there's I mean, we've got folks on the far right now. Uh, for instance, we had a presidential candidate just this week and um, say that um, they will cancel student visas for students that speak out against the United States. And I was just floored by that. It, how, how, where did we get off the train station where we had to start striking out against individuals because they said something that we don't like? And I really feel like that, that we've abandoned that principle of, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson. He said it in Latin, so it was a lot cooler, but uh, it was something along the lines that I much prefer uh, dangerous freedom to peaceful slavery. Yeah. And that, boy, here we are. Sarah, your thoughts on my question? Well, Wyoming used to be different. And I, I mean, I would have said, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, um, absolutely, it was the left. And I could see that like here in Wyoming, right, like we hadn't passed a bill. We, we had defeated every single bill that would have limited the rights of LGBTQ people for 45 straight years. And we're a Republican supermajority. So like the data was in, right? Like Republicans were holding the line and they, they weren't people who maybe even particularly liked gay people, but they liked the principle 
of the First Amendment, and they stuck to it, even when it was tested. And um, now it's that same party, it's the right, right, who is, it's like some kind of amnesia, like they don't even remember it. And if your views don't line up with theirs, then no rights for you. And so yeah, here in Wyoming, it, I mean, the left doesn't have power. So it is happening. And if it's happening, it's happening because of the right. (laughs) Now, you all did an event together, you alluded to it, but this Civic Season Festival that was hosted by the Wyoming State Museum, why, why do you think, uh, and I, I'll start with you, Sarah, why do you think it was important for you to participate in that? Yeah, I, I think it was probably one of the most important things I did this last year, because the opportunity for folks to see two people who um, love and respect each other and punch each other in the face rhetorically. (laughs) And um, I mean, it's not performative, right? Like Tyler and I believe wildly different things. Um, And since that is under such attack, it's being so threatened nationally in, in Wyoming, people need to see it. Like they can't just have it be sort of like a theoretical think piece. They need to see people who are not like, well, we basically agree. No, we don't. We believe very different things about the state and what the state should have the power to do. Um, And everybody there understood that when that was over and we were going to fight our corners tooth and nail, we were going to go have a beer together. And I think people need to see it in order to remember that that's the best America has to offer. And if we're not fighting for that principle, uh, you know, you only get to keep the things that you fight for. And if we're not fighting for it, it goes away. Right. Tyler, your, your thoughts on that event? Yeah, I thought it was a, um, a fantastic event. Probably the best part about that civic debate was um, Sarah's son coming up to me afterwards and admitting that he felt I was right. Um, <laughs> that was <laughs> in all seriousness. It, uh, you know, it, it's a really good opportunity to be able to go hard. I mean, Sarah's not joking. When Sarah and I debate, and our debates stem all the way back to the Wyoming legislature, when Sarah served also, um, the two, even this last summer, and I do agree, it was one of the most important things that I had the opportunity to participate in this summer, just based on the, um, the capability of showing people it's okay to disagree with each other and still show each other grace and I mean, once you're done with your with your boxing match and your debate, it's time to move on to something else. And that next thing you might agree on. And at that point, be best friends. And so, so yeah, we'll go ahead. I was just going to say, if people are on different sides of an issue, what, you, what should they keep in mind while they're having that discussion or debate, whether it's in a public forum or just personally? I, I think debating the issue is the most important thing. So many, so many times folks will Im- immediately resort to uh, personal attacks or straw men or something along the lines of um, taking the floor, the floor outside of someone's reach. And the problem I've got with that scenario is if your if, if your if your policy position and your position is strong and strong enough, it should be able to withstand crippling your opponent. The reality is lay out your case, um, lay it out in a manner that represents your position um, and, you know, be that happy warrior. And you're going to get a lot farther in this world. I I look at a lot of the folks that are now finding themselves in the legislature. We've had a recent influx of individuals that um, that really their only experience um, politically is Fox News or MSNBC. Um, something along those lines. Well, that's not reality and it's not relative to what an actual debate looks like. Um, and it's drifted so far now that most of the time, um, legislate, uh, legislative members are now going to the microphone with their printed out script and they read their script and then they mm-hmm. go sit back down. That's Congress. That's what Congress does. Let, con- let that stay in the swamp. Let, let the, leg- the state legislatures live free and wild and go to the microphone and beat the hell out of each other. Yeah. And then, you know, we'll be friends on the next one. Sarah, what your thoughts on what people should keep in mind when they're debating someone that they disagree with? Yeah, say the true thing. I mean, say the true thing. I think um, I think this is like this guy Gottman, who's like a marriage therapy guy. He talks about how contempt is the killer. 
And that's true of like all human relationships, right? I was uh, testifying in front of a committee a year ago, and I was so shocked that a legislator on the committee was so contemptuous towards me, like so snide, like I'm just not used to that. And I, and it, and I think other people were surprised that I was surprised, right? They're like, well, you're on other sides of the issue. And I was like, right, but I don't expect that. And I don't, I don't make room for it. It's unacceptable, right? Like I don't do it. I tried to, when I was in the legislature, I really tried to build a lot of space around um, people that we were in strong disagreement towards so that they knew that they had the same airtime, that they had the same respect, that they had the same dignity, you know, for their position, whether we agreed or not. And so that's a new thing. And I will say that I'm really um, jingoistic about Wyoming. When I found out that that legislator was a transplant here and had just moved here a few years ago, I was like, oh, well, that accounts for it. She's not from here. She doesn't know. We don't talk to each other that way. And we don't talk to each other that way. If that's not your foundation, then it's really hard to move up from there. Yeah, you know, I look at it as well. It seems to me one of the one of the main things you should do if you're going to have these kinds of debates, the best way to do it is to to talk about other things as well, right? We're not all about mm-hmm. politics. Right. So find out what the person, the other person that you're talking with Find out what they like. What do they like to do? What are you've got to have something in common with them? You know, maybe it's not a lot of people or, know Tyler Lindholm, big fan of ballet. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's it's true. It's true. Well, it was 100%. good having you, Tyler. I, I enjoyed having you as a state director. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, I didn't know that. That's that's well, really my, good to my know. wife was a, a, a former ballerina, so I'm a big fan of ballet in so far as my wife being a former ballerina. Uh-huh. I'm going to nod my head and say the things. <laughs> Sarah, thanks for giving me a couple more things to uh, make oh, fun of Tyler. There's, there's, I appreciate that. Let's talk after. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that important to kind of get to know that person so that you can always kind of anchor back to that in the conversation okay. Even when it gets tough, you can always anchor back to the thing you share in common. Sarah? I think when you listen to folks, you know, who are selling you something <laughs> or any sort of like political party, one of the, you know, tests that I have is, is it relational or is it transactional? And like, you know, some folks, they want you to go in there and get the signature, get the vote. Um, and then they're done. Like, you're not a real human to them. And I think that that's a a failing of extremists on all sides. And, you know, (laughs) the the paradox is, is that like, if you have good relations, those things that you want, like those transactions that you hope will occur, they are more likely to occur. And I, I don't know how to convince people of this, but like, if you've been in a foxhole together, like if your principal has stood under incredible pressure, even though, you know, everybody on your side is saying, don't do it. Like abandon ship. That guy's not worth it. Or whatever it is, there is a bond there. There is a, you know, a relationship that it's just stronger than most things. And, you know, Tyler standing up for non-discrimination. I can't tell you how wildly unpopular it was amongst the uh, extremist. And I always wondered, you know, if he would cave, if, if the pressure you know, to conform to something that I knew he didn't believe in, but was, you know, probably the better idea for him politically. Um, And he didn't because the principle held. And so I'll show up in some pretty weird places for that big redneck. Sounds like he would have caved if they would have gave him ballet tickets, but that's a whole nother deal. Um, No, I know what his number is. Tyler, any (laughs) thoughts on that? And then I want to go to a couple of issues regarding free speech and and let you two hash that out. But any other thoughts on that? No, Uh, I think, you know, I think Sarah nailed it. I mean, civility is the most important thing, Um, whether it's in a political circle or even just gassing up your vehicle at the gas station. Uh, Civility will will take this world uh, to wonderful places, but we have to embrace it. Right. We have to stop being horrible to each other. You can debate without being a horrible person. And you talked about being a, you you use the phrase happy warrior. And that is truly uh, the key to this, right? Is is just be decent. Like, you know, treat everyone the way you would want to be treated. It's kind of like the golden rule, right? I mean, isn't that basically it? Yeah, that's right. I mean, our our, our mamas uh, all taught us the same thing, right? Do unto others. 
And I, I really think we, we abandon that in the political circles, and, and especially with these organizations that teach confrontational politics, that it's the one size fit all and you can you can do things forever. That works one damn time. Yeah. <laughs> confrontational will work once. And then you burn those relationships with everybody that's ever going to possibly have anything to do with your legislation again. Um, it's a it's a garbage principle. And I, <laughs> it's much easier to go through life just smiling and, and being decent to people. All right, let's yeah. take a couple. Let's take a couple of issues with regard to free speech. Uh, social media companies should they be allowed to take down posts that they deem offensive or <laughs> wrong or incorrect? Let's start with you, Sarah. Well, I mean, private entities get to do what private entities want to do, right? Like the state actually can't come in, and um, we just saw. I mean, there was a landmark case here in Wyoming. Um, same principle. Right. That uh, Judge Johnson said these folks who wanted to tell um, Kappa Gamma sorority over in Laramie um, whether they could or could not allow transgender women to to um, pledge for the sorority. Well, the sorority said, yes, we will. And we've, that, we that's been our position for the last 15 years. Um, but these right wing extremists said, no, we'd like the state to come in and tell a privately owned company what they can and can't cannot do. And so for me, like, that's the principle, right? Like, I might think that Twitter has become a garbage fest since, you know, Elon Musk um, purchased it. And I recognize, you know, the rights of the market and the rights of um, free expression within a, you know, private ownership. Okay. What about you, uh, Tyler? You want to shut him down? Tyler? <laughs> I why, actually, why is she, Sarah wrong? Well, so first of all, Twitter's got nothing but better. Uh, oh. There's a lot of my friends on Twitter. Do you really believe that? Absolutely, I believe oh. that. Absolutely, I think it's actually become uh, more transparent by far. Uh, and there's proof now that uh, Twitter's not working with the federal government and shutting down certain things from being said. Uh, so that's that's really nice. But I do agree with the the simple principle that uh, private entities um, have the right to transact. Um, as long as they're they're not uh, you know violating someone's rights or something like that, your speech does not extend to somebody else, somebody else's own backyard. Um, if somebody doesn't like what you're saying in, the, in their own backyard, they can kick you out. And social media companies have that right and capability to do that. Um, if you happen to be on a social media um, platform uh, that is censoring your speech or censoring um, other people's like you speech, you don't have to be there. Uh, move on. Go to go to a better uh, a better site. There are better sites out there like uh, Twitter dot com or X, I think is what it's called now. OK, How, but should government be allowed to ask social media companies to take down posts? What, what are your thoughts on that, Sarah? Yeah. So I would say anytime there's like an absolute right that you're probably in dangerous territory um, just because. I mean, th there there are exceptions that are realities, right? Like, if the post is an active, you know, terrorist threat, yes, you should be able to. You, the government should say, "Hey, buddy, a lot of people are going to die. Uh, don't do that." And that is a reasonable um, action. And the people who want, you know, always or never, like, there's nothing in jurisprudence, there's nothing in democracy that works like that. Everything is regulated. Everything has exceptions. And how we find those, like how we find together, like what those limits are, where, where my free expression ends and yours begins, that's the rule of government. So if somebody wants to put up a, um, hey, Proud Boys will be meeting um, in Idaho today. Our plan is to attack, you know, this group and with these weapons, we hope you'll join us. Um, I'd like to believe that the companies themselves would have a process in place that says, well, we're not going to host that. Um, but if they don't, I think that the government um, certainly can say, hey, that's a violation. Like you're on these you know, airwaves or you're on these whatever, like it is regulated by the United States government and there are limitations to it. But those limitations, like they should be small, right? Like I, I don't mean like, obviously, if somebody disagrees with you. Um, that that is within the parameters. They've got what, to be really steep. Sarah, what about, uh, you know, during COVID, we saw the, the government interacting with social media companies, going to social media companies and saying, 
hey, we think this is dangerous because it's misinformation about yeah. COVID. Now, many of those things turned out to actually not be misinformation um, at the end of the day. But does government, is that or the role, the proper role of government? Or does that violate the First Amendment in your view? I think uh, during COVID, you can absolutely say that there were times that the U.S. government overstepped, right? And in an, inf- in an effort to curb misinformation, which I think is a very laudable goal during a pandemic, um, they overstepped and they took down things that, look, people have a right to be wrong. People have a right to say the things, um, even if it, you know, hurts members of the community, Um but I don't think that you can have that conversation without talking about Russia's role in it, without talking about, you know, bad actors who were actively, you know, trying to cause as much harm as possible. And that's the problem with, like, extremism being in the driver's seat right now, right? Is like, it's hard to have a conversation about nuance when, you know, everybody is everybody else's enemy. Do people, Sarah, I'll ask this question and I'm going to turn it over to Tyler to respond, but do people have the right in America to be, to be wrong, to be racist, to be crude, those sorts of things? Yeah. So, I mean, we're working on hate crimes legislation in Wyoming right now. And one of the things that we're trying to educate our people and is that like, you know, some things are awful and they are lawful, right? People say hateful, dumb, homophobic, transphobic crap all the time. And it's not against the law. And I mean, there's a lot of things that the law is there to do. The vast majority of it is what humans are here to do without the benefit or the <laughs> the, the demerit of, of the law getting involved. Most of it is us being humans together. Yeah. Tyler, your thoughts on, first of all, the government stepping in and asking social media companies to take down posts that they felt were inaccurate or disinformation. And then that, that question about, you know, do people have the right to be wrong or racist or those sorts of things? Right. Well, I, I, I think it's a super important conversation to have considering, you know, the, the recent actions of the federal government with some of these social media companies and, and it clear, I mean, it was drawn out pretty clearly um, in discovery as far as what Congress was able to find as um, in regards to the direct um, coordination between, at the time, Twitter and uh, the federal government. I, I, I think it's probably one of the more reprehensible um, things that the federal government, I mean, there's a, there's a long laundry list of reprehensible activities the federal government is consistently up to, so I don't want to put this at like the top. They're just pretty horrible on everything. And this is a, another one of those situations where they, um, you know, they're morally bankrupt. They're just trying to push their their agenda. Um, I think at, a, at, at some point, I'm sure there was someone um, that thought we have to do this to protect people. Um, but it, it, it did abandon some very basic principles. Um, and, and one of the things that, that Sarah brought up, um, she brought up small government, how government should be very small in this situation. I think she meant to say that government should be small in all situations. Um, but <laughs> You know, that's we'll work I've on. Never it. in a million years would I say that government should be small in a pandemic. <laughs> and a pandemic is when you want the government to be clear and broad and pass giving you good information. Pass. <laughs> oh man, I, I wish well, there was someone in your life who was a public health nurse who could explain this a little better to you. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, and, well, and I, I think to continue on down that though, when it when it comes to. Um, you know, hate speech and those types of things. Yeah, I 100% agree. It might be awful, but it is lawful. Um, and I actually kind of endorse um, this activity as far as if, if somebody wants, I, I'm glad that it's lawful uh, because if by somebody saying these, ho- these horrible things um, without any government intervention, the wonderful thing about that is that opens the door for people like me and people like Sarah and people like Jeff to go absolutely start a dunk fest on people like that. If you're going to say racist things around me, I'm, I'm going to hurt your feelings. Yeah. And I'm going to do so in a manner that can tear down every, every piece of infrastructure you've got around that. Um, and, and yeah, so I guess I think it's a pretty great system we got if we only followed it a little bit closer and we didn't have to sue over everything to be able to find out what is speech. It seems very clear to me what is speech. 
You know, it does seem uh, to me that when particularly, you know, somebody says something racist, uh, they they can before they say a racial epithet or something, um, you know, they almost sound they, they can almost convince you with their logic or argument. But the moment that they say that, mm-hmm. say that word or the moment they say something just truly racist, that's the moment when almost every normal American looks at them, and goes up, oh, you're crazy. So why wouldn't we want people to expose themselves if that's who they are, right? Because it, it immediately disqualifies them from from being uh, someone who is an authority on anything as soon as they go there. That That's kind of the way I look at it. Yeah, I yeah. love this Shangri-La that you guys have um, put together. That has not been my experience. I like the idea that it just brings it out into the light of day. So that we can all say absolutely not. But I got to tell you, looking at all the CRT bills, looking at all of the, I mean, we had it floated that we don't want the Holocaust taught in the state of Wyoming. Um, Because, you know, we got to teach both sides. right? Uh, Well, I think that was a very small, small group that came out um, that wanted to limit that. I mean, ultimately, the Wyoming legislature defeated that bill. Mutual friend of ours, uh, Representative Andy Schwartz. went after that bill. So that was, I don't think that's most of Wyoming. I think that's a very small percentage. Oh, I never think it's most of the Wyoming, but I always, uh, you know, in, in the last couple of years, will will live by the reality that they're getting most of the airtime. They get the microphone the majority of the time. <laughs> like, do they represent the majority of Wyoming? No, I don't think they do. I'd, I'd, I'd cry in my beer if I thought they did. <laughs> All right. Well, Sarah and Tyler, thank you both for joining us. Tyler, is that a is that a tutu you have on? I, I, <laughs> no, I'm rocking some AFB uh, so Iowa. I, <laughs> you don't want to joke about tutus in Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole, that's a whole another story. That we'll might be a podcast by itself. <laughs> All right. All right. Hey, both. Thank thank you both for joining us, and thanks for helping lead the discussion on how to have a civil debate with one another. I appreciate you spending time with us today. Anytime. Thanks for having Thank us Thank you, on. Jeff. You bet. Okay, well, listen, this is, this is the bedrock of America. We have to be able to talk to one another about the most important, you know, people will say, don't talk about politics and religion. Absolutely not. Talk about politics and religion. That's what the First Amendment is about. It's not to talk about who has the best steaks or who has the, makes the best hamburger in your community. That stuff's not even important. What is important are government, our freedoms, our liberties, liberty and freedom. They're so easily taken for granted. Don't take those things for granted. Go out there, defend freedom, defend liberty. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to American Potential. You may listen to more stories from Americans working every day to expand freedom and opportunity in their communities by visiting AmericanPotential.com.